Hey, Sam, how's it going? Better. Much better. Yeah, really? Good. Thank yeah. God. Thank yeah. God. This, 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 this stuff saved my life. I, I don't know what it is. I don't either, but it works. It's an inhaler. <laughs> it's an inhaler. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. It's like a magic, magic bullet. Wow. Thank God. Thank God for that. Thank yeah. God for that. Okay. Um, hey, Preston. So we'll begin. The, the, um, yesterday, we read the portion of Toldos, which I think was pretty fundamental in, in um, how we are still here today, as we'll discuss. So the fact that the Jewish people are alive and sort of dodge so many different bullets and so many um, different obstacles. And, and, and while there were, if, if, if it was in Vegas, right? If Vegas, if Vegas was around, you know, a thousand years ago, the, the odds of our survival, uh, you could have made a lot of money because, you know, the over under, I mean, Vegas would have really put us as, as a uh, zero chance. And the fact that we're here has to do with this week's Pasha. So it begins, these are the generations, because the Torah continues where it left off last week, that Isaac, Isaac married Rebecca. Yitzchak married Rivka. And the Torah portion continues where it says, these are the generations of Yitzchak, Isaac, the son of Abraham. Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. So if Yitzchak is the son of Abraham, we know that Abraham gave birth to Yitzchak. Why is that redundancy? And... Um, what the, what the what is this explained is as follows that um, the Nachas was a two way street. Yitzchak was a son of Abraham. Yitzchak let everybody know that that my father was an incredible, incredible person. Likewise, Abraham, he had such Nachas from his kid Yitzchak. So it was it was both both were 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 lauded the the other, as opposed to when it talks about Esau, it says his, the generations of Esau, in this week's Pasha, Esau, the son of, um, when it says Esau, the son of Yitzchak, it doesn't say Yitzchak gave birth to Esau. It only has it one way, Yishmael, the son of Abraham. It doesn't say Abraham gave birth to Yishmael because it wasn't, it wasn't a two-way street. It was just a one-way street. And um, it kind of reminds me of people that have um, that have on their on their in their living room or their dining room or they have in their piano. They, when you come in, they take you straight away to the picture and say, "This is my great grandfather. He was such a great, holy, holy, holy person, and, and he was unbelievable. He was uh, the the Rav of Krakow. He was the Rabbi of." of you know, check, he was this, he was that. But would the rabbi of Czech say that about their grandchild, right? Here's, so that's what the Torah is saying, is that it was, it was a two-way street. And like Sarah, like Abraham and Sarah, Rivka and Yitzchak could not have kids. They were married 10 years and they still couldn't have kids. Now, we, we are told in the Code of Jewish Law that... Um, that, that if somebody can, cannot have children, you have to wait 10 years. Because, uh, so in other words, uh, uh, to, to divorce somebody, man or woman, woman or man, doesn't matter. You need that 10 year limit because who knows what could happen in 10 years. And it's not a reason for divorce. After 10 years, it is. So they were married 10 years. And Isaac prayed in his corner. Rebecca prayed in her corner. And it says that by um, also Loi Hashem, Hashem turned to him, to Isaac, and Rivka became pregnant. So the commentaries are ablaze. Rashi says, and the difference, Rashi says that the, um, the, the fact that the reason why God answered Isaac is because look at his pedigree. Look at his, look at his parents. And as opposed to Rivka, Rivka's pedigree, look at her parents. That was, you know, the, the, uh, the wicked Betuel, she's the brother of Laban. And 
right? So he was he deserved to be answered. But there's other commentaries that actually are the polar opposite. They say that what was Yitzchak's prayer? What was Rebecca's prayer? So Yitzchak's Rebecca's prayer was, God, I'm begging you, if not for me, do it for Isaac. He's such a holy man. His father was such a holy man. Do it for him. Isaac's prayer was, God, do it for Rebecca. Look what Rebecca accomplished. How incredible is it that she was able to, 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 to survive spiritually such a wicked, wicked home? And Hashem, according to this commentary, God said to Yitzchak, you're right. You're right. Rebecca, it's her merit. I'm going to do it for her because she survived a, a spiritually corrupt, bankrupt home. And look at her. So when it says that, that God responded to Isaac, is because his prayers were for Rebecca. And she conceived. The next verse is that the children, by Sreitzatsu, they agitated within her. And it was so painful. And she went to seek advice. So when it, we're taught, by the way, we were taught this by, by the Rebbe, not necessarily by the Rebbe, but the Rebbe's approach. And she, she did this as well. The Rebbe's approach is if a person has um, a medical issue, you go get a blessing from a holy person and go to a doctor. So what she did is she went to a holy person. She went to shame. Right? Noah's son was still alive, a very old man, but he was holy. And she, he, she said, what well, gives? So shame, via prophecy, told her, Rivka, your pain and your agitation is because you have two, not one, forces within you. And he says, they are not just, they're not just babies, they're not just uh, you know, fetuses, but rather they're two regimes. These two in you are going to be huge, right? It's it, they're going to be incredible. They're going to be something that is so. Um, they're going to be nations, right? And the might shall pass from one to the other, and the elder shall serve. I mean, what prophecy? The elder shall serve the young. And Rivka said, "Okay, okay, I get it. It's not just one child. I'm having his two children, and and." And, um, and, and they're both different. They're both different. They're, they're, they're two regimes, two separate regimes. So the Rebbe explains that Rivka was very concerned because if it was one child, she said, why is he so agitated? Why is he so agitated? One, one child, right? And every time I walk by a pagan house of idol worship or a pagan establishment, I get kicks. And every time I walk by a, 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 a mon house of monotheism, I get kicks. So she said, what's with this kid? But once she was told that it's not, it's two forces. One is more of an idol worshiper and the other is more of a, a monotheist. She was, she was fine. She was fine with it. And the reason she was fine is because it, it's when a person is torn the whole time. Should I serve God? Should I serve Baal? Should I serve God? Should I serve the Almighty Dollar? Should I serve God? Should I serve the flesh? Should I serve God? Should I do this? You're torn the whole time, and 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 um, and also if you're a vacillator, should I do this? Should I do that? You'll ne you you wish you washing. You'll never have a concrete. You'll never be able to set yourself straight. That was her concern. But once she was told it's two separate things, she goes, okay, so the one, right? Um, one is, is that she, she is, is going to serve God. And the other one is going to serve uh, paganism, right? That was less of a concern for her. Because as the Rebbe, the Rebbe says, in, in, in when he talks about Elijah and Mount Carmel, the Rebbe says that if a person is a vacillator, they can never be true to their own. Because they'll always say, no, no, I believe in God. I just, uh, I also believe in Baal. And the Rebbe said, that is corruption within corruption. When a person has a clear, concrete opinion, then they can't be swayed. 
When a person is a vacillator, they can't be swayed. They just can't. Because they said, no, 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 I agree with you, but I also agree with that. You know, it's like the rabbi that was educating a, 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 uh, a Beth Din. And when the plaintiff was talking, he told the plaintiff, you're right. And when the defendant, defendant was talking, he turned to the, plaintiff, the defendant and said, you're right. So his wife was sitting outside, comes running in and she says, honey, how can they both be right? One of them has got to be right and one of them has got to be wrong. So he turned to her and said, you're right. Right. So uh, the problem with a, with a vacillator, an agitator, uh, a, a, a vacillator is somebody who's, who's wishy-washy is that they'll never, they'll never develop the backbone. And that was her concern. So the bottom line is we have conviction. That is the best way to be. Conviction. But you made me call out them. Let me let me hear what you have to say. Right. So you have conviction that you 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 always unless the Torah forbids it. And I believe I believe uh, you know Joe Biden is right. I believe Joe Biden. I believe Trump is. Right. You know, let's let's hear it. the truth is some probably somewhere in the middle. The fact that you have you know seventy million of each, and each one is says the other one is so wrong. Maybe there's a little bit of give and take here. You know. Who knows, time will tell. Um, if not, it's a huge test. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, if not, wow. Anyway, so she was pregnant and the first one came out. He was ruddy. He had hair, Rifka had a lot of heartburn, he had a lot, had to have a lot of pepsin when she was pregnant. And, um, and they called him Aesop. Aesop is Ayin Shin Vav, which means Asui. He was like ready-made. He, he was a, a, a baby, but he, was, he had hair over his body. He, he, he was red, he was big, he was a starker. So they called him Esau Astui. Made, ready, ready, ready to rumble. The second one came out and he was holding on to the foot, the heel of Esau, which symbolizes a lot of things that he's holding, it doesn't let him go. Right, he pulls and yanks him down, and um, and they called him Yaakov. So Yud Akev, Yud is God's name. Akev, heel. That's what they called him. And the Torah tells us, as the children grew up, it was very clear who, what was what. Esav knew how to trap. He was a hunter, and Yaakov was was the academic. So Rashi says that when he said he knew how to trap. He knew how to trick you with his mouth. His father, who was blind, thought that he was the neatest thing since sliced bread. He said, you know what? My, my son, my son is just incredible. My son, he, he, um, he, he's, just, he's just amazing. He, is a, um, he asked me all these halachic questions, but really it was just, it was just, he was a charlatan. He was a chameleon when he was around Isaac. He acted one way. When he was around Rebecca, he acted another way. When he was around tricksters and hunters and murderers, he acted another way. So that's what it means. He was a trapper. And uh, Yaakov was an academic. Anyway, it was one day that Torah tells us, and this is probably one of the most important days in, um, right? And what Steve Levy writes is what Rashi says is that Rivka was inseminated with Jacob's seed first. Esau came out first, but the insemination was, was um, the first seed to penetrate the egg. And clearly they were not identical, by the way, so it was, it was two eggs. Um, it, it, the first seed was Jacob's. So um, it was the day of Abraham's funeral. It was Yaakov and Esau had reached 13 years old. And um, God took away five years from Abraham's life because he didn't want to see, um, he didn't want to see these kids grow up. Um, Esau to see, Abraham to see Esau grow up and be such a, uh, such a, such a wicked individual. So he didn't want to see how Esau lives to, uh, move to 18. Um, so therefore, he died prematurely. Five years was taken off his life. 
and he died at 175 years old. And it was, they were 13 at the time, and it was the day of the funeral. So as we're familiar, on the day of the funeral, the family, the mourners, eat something round. They eat an egg, they eat lentils, they eat um, just something round to symbolize that the, the life has not ended and their life has not ended. So they, um, Yaakov was making the lentils for his, for his family. He was making these lentils. And um, Esau comes. And it was the meal, of the, morning, the meal of the morning, right? Esau comes and Esau says, um, no. Give me from this red mixture. So it was red lentils. No. It could also have been Starbucks, you know, Xmas blend. Um, but uh, give me, and he used the word no, which is please, which is not like Aesop. So no means please. No, by the way, could also mean raw. I don't care if they're ready. Give it to me now. So Yaakov said to him, okay, I'll give it to you. Um, but sell me the firstborn rights. So Aesop's response was, Look, you only live once. You only live once. And I have no need of these firstborn rights. Um, and therefore, I'll sell it to you. He goes, swear to me. So he swore to him. And Yaakov gave him bread, and Yaakov gave him lentils, and Yaakov gave him soup, and he and, and to drink, and he ate, etc. And, and he completely spurned the birthright. So... Yaakov's response to him was Michra Chayoyim, sell to me as the clear as the day, right? This is not chicken meat. I want you to sell to me the birthright for dinner, right? To dinner, right? So he said, so when people tell me that, that he, he um, Yaakov stole the birthright, I think the Torah makes it very clear that he didn't steal the birthright. He sold the birthright. You know, there are many, there are stories um, of, of, of in the Balshento's time and others' time where somebody sold his world to come. He said, I'll sell it to you. I need money, I'll sell it to you. And he sold it to him. So, you know, the, it, it's not advisable to sell your birthright. It's not advisable to sell your world to come, right? It's not advisable to buy a used car either. Um, from a used car dealer, but, um, but, but people still do it. So he bought it outright. It was fair and square. And um, so it really, you know, when they say that he got it through chickenry and all this, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, you, you, you buy a house, you know, and by the way, an oral, an oral pledge is considered, an oral contract is an oral. You can go to court over an oral contract. This is an oral contract. And then he, he, he grounded it with food. And as Joel says, he called the heaven to be his witness and the food to be his witness. Just got a drink. My throat is, my throat is not, my throat is raw. Now, just like his father, there was a famine. So Yitzchak, who was, uh, was, was, had to travel, he traveled once again to um, the Gaza Strip called Philistine. And just like his father did, he said about his wife, she's my sis. And, um, and Abimelech, just like, um, just like, so Abimelech would took Sarah actually as a captive. Here he learned the hard way not to take someone else's wife. Um, but he did, he, okay, sister, sister, he took it to face value. And one day the Torah tells us that, that Abimelech was a peeping Tom and he looked into the window and he saw Yitzchak and Rivka right, um, having relations. And um, he, he immediately called out Yitzchak and he said, why'd you lie to me? He goes, because it's not normal that someone should ask, who is this woman to you? Right? It's not normal. It says, you know, you're supposed to ask, you know, uh, what are the camels worth? Are you carrying any gold, any contraband? How long do you plan to be in the Gaza Strip? Right? What's your purpose of visit to the Gaza Strip? 
But instead they say, oh, who's this chick, right? Anyway, so once Abi Mela, once Abi Mela realized that this is that he, and he, that this is uh, you know the same deal as he had with Abram, he 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 said, I don't want to get punished again. Let me tell you, Isaac, the land is yours. Take it, his gifts. Just do. You, you have full permission to cry, to 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 live in the Gaza Strip, which, by the way. Maybe not now, but in, in Abu Melech's time, it was probably gorgeous. You know, right on the water, on the Mediterranean, you know, with, with uh, nice sandy beaches without any uh, bomb making materials or, or, um, or any hashish there. It was just a nice, nice place to live. And he talked it very well in the Gaza. He had one problem, is they were jealous. They were jealous. Now, they were jealous, and because they were jealous, they did the unthinkable. But history repeats itself time and time again. What do they do? Yitzchak had many of his people to work with him. You know, he was a wealthy man. He had shepherds, he had contractors, etc. So Yitzchak, his people dug wells. When you dig a well, you dig deep, you find water, you firm up the well, you have a mechanism where the water comes up and you, you put down the bucket, et cetera. Along came, because of jealousy, along came the Philistines and they threw earth into the well and they clocked it up. That happened a few times and they, they argued over it. Now, if you think about it, that is classic, classic anti-Semitism, right? What do you do? Your country is Spain. Your country is very prosperous, right? You have a Barnabel, who was, who was the, one of the greatest rabbis and a winemaker. He's also the minister of finance. Country is doing very well. So what do you do? Instead of saying thank you to Aunt Barnabel, they start killing off the Jews. And, it's, and the Jews are wealthy people. They are, so they give them the ultimatum, get out. They start filling their wells. They start ruining their businesses. Right? To this day, to this day, 550 years later, or 530 years later, right? It 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 hasn't recovered. Spain, you know, Spain ruled. Right? And we see this time and time again. Is that because of jealousy, they they um they they take they take out. They take out the the uh, they take out the Jews, and then their country never rebounds. Right? Think, <laughs> right? Think of England. Right? Kicked out the Jews for three hundred years. England never really recovered. Right? And and place, right? England was three hundred years. You know, then there was Poland, and then there's you know Russia and and. Uh, Germany, right? I mean, you have it all over. You have, you have it all over, right? York, where they kill Jews, is just a hit town, right? Right? Iran, Iraq, um, it's just you know. What 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 is um the the Jews in 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 Syria, you know, in Aleppo and other places, right? It was tremendous. And then because of forty eight, of potential forty eight. They kick the Jews out. What's in Aleppo now? Ruins. Aleppo used to be where the richest Jews lived with mansions. It's ruins. It's just nothing. So they they covered they covered the the um, they covered the wells. One well. I remember a well is a construction. It's major construction. It's like you know tearing down a building. So they 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 stuffed one well. They stuffed another well, and then they finally Isaac moved away, and. They dug a third well, and that remained the well. We learn from here is that we cannot, we cannot be, you know, dis dissuaded, and that is part of the secret of our success is that we have to have perseverance. We must must persevere. We cannot just say, okay, they, you know, they stop one well, they stop another well. Um, I'm, I give up. As the Jew, we don't give up. So we we um, we move a little bit here, we move a little bit there, but we we do not give up in any way, shape, or form. Now, um, 
they also they also teach us that these the three wells allude to the to the three temples. The first temple was destroyed, second temple was destroyed, and the third temple, just like Isaac, that one remained, and it's in Beersheba, and the Torah tells us, Ad Hayemazeh. It's until this very day the Torah tells us that. So this third temple will also be a permanent. Torah continues, and this is the, 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 the highlight of the Pasha, where, where Jake, Isaac was blind, and he said, I don't know when I'm going to die, but I, um, I want to bless you, Esau, before I die. So he tells Esau, get me matamim, get me delicacies, get me, you know, get me some meat, get me some game, right? None of this tofu stuff, and none of this cottage cheese, I want meat, right? Um, by the way, there's a restaurant in Brooklyn um, that's, that's called Meat. It's supposed to be very good. It's a flat kosher restaurant called Meat. So that's what he wanted. He wanted meat. So Esau put on his hunting gear. Meanwhile, Rivka, our matriarch Rivka, the mother of Esau, the mother of Jacob says, listen, I heard your dad talking to Esau that he's going to bless him. He says, this is what I want. I want you to get meat. I want you to take these goats. We have it right here. We don't have to go hunting. Prepare them quickly and go get the blessing. She goes, but he didn't ask me to do that. He asked Esau. He goes, we're going to dress you like Esau. He goes, but then he'll curse me. So she goes, any curses will be on me. You need that blessing. This was critical that he get the blessing so that the Jewish people are able to survive. And once again, he was the firstborn. So when Isaac was about to dish out the firstborn blessing, Rivka said, look, he may not know the scoop. I know the scoop, right? I know the scoop. So go get that blessing. So she prepared it while he put on these clothing. And he put on clothing of Esau that smelled like Esau. And she put on goat's hair on his arms because he was very hairy, right? Must have been quite a scene. <clears throat> and he um, and he went into Asa, and he goes, Avi, father. So he goes, who is this? So he goes, it's Ani, it is I, Asa of your firstborn. So Rashi says right away, hey, Rashi, it's kind of a little bit weak, but Rashi says it was two separate statements, Ani, I, and Aesop is your first one, right? <laughs> That's what Rashi says. Anyway, he says, come closer, comes closer. And he touches him and he goes, wow, you have the voice of Jacob, but you have the hands, the furry, rough hands of, of Aesop. So he says, come eat and bless me. So he gave him food. And by the way, we learn from here that Jacob's power is the voice and Aesop's power is the sword, is the hands. Esau, the Romans fight, Jacob prays. And, um, and he blesses him, he eats, and he blesses him. And, and he blesses him. And, he, and by the way, it says that he smelt Ganadin, he smelt this, this, he smelt Garden of Eden, because Jacob once again was holy. And he smelt, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was like cut grass, it was a very special smell. And, um, and he told them, God should give you from the, the dew of the heavens and the fat of the earth, and you should have you know, physical blessings, abundant grain and wine, people should serve you, regimes, regimes should prostrate themselves before you, all right? And uh, you should be a Lord, and your mother's sons will prostrate themselves before you, right? Curse to those who curse you, this is spiritual already, and bless be those who bless you. He got seven blessings, incredible blessings. Now, if not for these blessings, then your brothers will prostrate themselves before you. We would have been doomed. We would have been doomed. We would have been a thing of the past. This blessing is the trick, the key to our survival today. Today, those blessings. So he got those blessings and he left. Asaph comes in. And Asaph says, eat. Like a different tone. 
And he says, Vayechad Yitzchak Harada Gedela. Yitzchak trembled. Isaac said, wow. And he was putting the pieces together. And, um, and then the first thing Yitzchak says, which is very telling, he says that somebody came and already took your blessing. And, and he says, well, bless me also. He goes, no, your brother came and took it. Right, so when someone came, was, was, was that, you know, he didn't want to tell him who it was, he figured it out or not, but clearly he figured it out. And then Yitzchak, and we spoke about it yesterday. Yitzchak said these, these incredible words, that someone came that took your blessing, let him remain blessed. Right? Let him remain blessed. This is not something a parent does, right? Except for my father. Right? I remember once my, my, my brother, I was, I know, seven, my brother was, I was eight, my brother was four, whatever. And I caught my brother with his hands in my father's pants pocket while my father was sleeping, stealing money. So, um, <laughs> borrowing money. No, it was, it was stealing money. And I grabbed my brother, little blondie, to my father. I woke my father up and said, he was stealing money from your trouser pocket. My father wipes his eyes. My father looks at me. My father looks at him. And he says, he is just so cute. Let him keep the money. Okay. So that, that as a parent, I know that's warped, right? You don't do that. A kid, a kid steals money from you, from your pants pocket, right? Is, 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 you got to teach a kid a lesson. My father said, nah, come Baruch yeah, let him remain blessed. Isaac did that. You don't do that unless you're convinced. Either the kid is cute which Esau was not. He was ruddy, big, and powerful, and sweaty. Um, and and he, he, he was... And he, 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 so so um, uh, Jacob... Uh, I'm sorry, Esau, Jacob was... He said, bless him. Bless him. Let him remain blessed. Which is... Well, here's a, here, so here, let's flesh this out. You have Rebecca, who was the instigator of this. Jacob knew nothing of it. Rebecca her, and Rebecca Imenu, Rebecca the Tzadikas, the, the woman, righteous woman, says, let's do this, Jacob. Isaac, he figured out something out, and he says, let him remain blessed. Right? They didn't give in. They didn't let Esau take the blessing, neither of them. Neither Jacob, Rebecca, or Isaac and we don't say because of that, they can't be buried in the cave of Machpelah. We don't say because of this, they're not our patriarchs or our matriarchs. Nothing changes. So if this was such a cardinal sin and was so bad as people claim it is, there's no way the Torah would let them get away with this. No way. They did this and it was considered a good thing. And, and, and I think the way it was explained to me a long time ago, Was that if it was world, imagine yourself in World War II and you have the ability to blow up a munitions factory worth millions and millions of dollars. You have the ability to blow up a tank with, with eight Nazis inside. Is that considered a moral dilemma or not? No, I would say not. You're stopping the Nazis by blowing up a munition factory. Billions of dollars, millions of dollars, who cares? Are the Nazis in the right or wrong? They're in the wrong, they're murderers. So you stop them. Blow up a tank, there's Nazis inside. Who cares? It's not a moral dilemma. It's not. In fact, it deserves a purple heart, which is what they gave, right? It's no moral dilemma. Likewise, Rebecca and Esau, did not have a moral dilemma. Once they sort of sussed out, where Rivka wasn't blind, she, she knew right away that Esau was a trapper and a, and a charlatan. But, um, and, and, and then once, then, then Esau, by the way, confessed to his father. He goes, oh, he took my birthright. And that was red flags that went up for Isaac. 
right? He took his purse, like, oh, Allah, what happened to him? Anyway, so then Esau asked him again, have you not one blessing? Because I've given him everything. I don't have a blessing for you. Right? It's, it's strange. So Esau cried. So Esau said, I have one thing. I'll give you the fat of the land. Right? This is, it was a two-part blessing. I'll give you the fat of the land. Now, he already gave Jacob the fat of the land. So there's a Gemara, Tom, it says that it was a piece of land not yet made yet. Right? And there's a story in the Talmud is that when King Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter, an angel took a stick in disgust and threw it in the Mediterranean. He threw it in the Mediterranean and um, what was that? Maybe not Mediterranean. What's, what's Atlantic or Mediterranean? Mediterranean. He threw it in the Mediterranean in the water and that stick attracted sand and eventually became a sandbar and a large sandbar. And on that sandbar was owned by the Greeks who the Romans conquered and called it Rome. And from there, he had the fat of the land, you know, a lot of olives and a lot of artichokes. And from there, which was now the second part of the blessing is it, it, that you are able to beat your brother if your brother removes the yoke of heaven. So when during the during the second temple, when there were more um, there were more people, um, you know, there were there were there were more people interested in 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 um, you know other things than God, and they were fighting amongst themselves. The Romans were able to defeat. So the fat of the land refer, refers to Rome, and um, and you were able to beat your brother. That is, um, if they remove the yoke, which they did. And so Esau did get some something. He did get something. So basically, Esau, by the way, is the is the we know we know that that um, Esau is basically for the most part Europeans. The, 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 you know, it wasn't necessarily Europeans from of old, but the but the uh, the Europeans that con the the Romans that conquered um, the the the, uh, the the soldier the the Enemies of the Greeks conquered Rome, and they and they settled there. So they are the contemporary day Europeans. And it's interesting to note that the Gaulus, right? So the first temple was destroyed by the Greeks. The temple was rebuilt. Second temple was destroyed by the Romans. It wasn't rebuilt. So we still are in the Roman Gaulus. Aesop still rules us, right? And um. And and um, so the, the you know the Europeans and and um, you know the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, right? Still still rule us. And if you think about it, it's the whole of Europe is is, is comes from the same family. And, and even America comes from the same family, right? Right. The the uh, the Bushes. The Washington was a cousin. Right. Washington was a cousin. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's it's all it's all one family, and they they still rule us. We're still we're still in Galut. We're still in exile. Um, Aesop was furious and said, "You know what? I'm going to kill him, but I'm not going to kill him now. I'm going to kill him when Dad dies. I respect Dad." And Aesop was rewarded for that, by the way. Um, I respect Dad. I don't like Mom, but I respect Dad. And when Dad dies, I'm going to kill him. So Rivka, via prophecy, knew this plot. And she, she, she told Yitzhak, I don't want my son marrying a Hittite, right? one of the seven nations. I don't want him marrying a Hittite like Esau did. I want him to marry someone from the family. So Yitzhak called him in, he blessed him, and he says, go to Lavan. Your mother had, you know, we get, we, I had success there, you all have success there. And she sent him. Esau saw that 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 the trick, the key to get loved by his parents was to marry in the family. So he married Ishmael's daughter. And so that was the family. The problem is, as Rashi says, is that he didn't divorce the Hittite. 
So now he is married to the Chittite, he was married to Bosmas, he was married to someone else, two women. Then he married the family, but he didn't, he didn't get rid of the other two wives who was a thorn in his side, but he did marry Ishmael's, Ishmael's daughter. And um, that's how the Torah, Torah concludes. Now it's interesting, there's a Rashi here that, um, right, um, it says that, that Yitzchak sent Yaakov and he went to Padan Aram. He went to, um, to Lavan, right? He went to Lavan, who is the brother of Rivka, who is the mother of Yaakov and Esau. And the Rashi is a very, very strange Rashi. Rashi says, I don't know why it has to say the mother of Yaakov and Esau. That's what Rashi says. I don't know. Rashi says, I don't know what the Torah is adding when it says the mother of Yaakov and Esau. That's a, that's a Rashi. And people try to figure out why Rashi would even say that. Just not comment. Why comment? So while I don't have an answer, I did see somewhere that it's interesting that Rivka put, the Torah put Yaakov before Esau. The Torah acknowledged that Yaakov was the older one. Maybe not. Maybe he, he, he was um, not bio, biologically older, but he had the birthright. So I don't know why Rashi says that. I don't know what the Torah is adding here, but it is, it is a cogent thought that they were telling Lavan, you know what? The older one's coming to you. And, um, and, and uh, he's, he is the older one. Just, a, just an interesting thought. So um, what was the status of Aesop? So it's interesting, in the time of this debate, was Aesop considered a Jew? Was Esau considered a non-Jew? Well, we know Yaakov's lineage, right? We're all Jews. So there's a debate. And according to most, he was a Jewish apostate. Right? He was a Jew that basically had gone astray and didn't believe in God. And therefore, um, not, not good. Others say that he actually was not even considered a Jew, and therefore it's less punishment for him. If you're a Jew, not, forget punishment. It's less spiritually, he's better spiritually well off. If he was a Jew and became an apostate, the Torah doesn't have nice things to say about that. But if you're a non-Jew right, who, who um, doesn't believe in God, it, it's, it's, while it's still part of the seven Noahide laws, it's, it's not as bad as being a Jewish apostate. So they debate, they try and give him a little credit here and there, but um, there's, there's, there's uh, no concrete, um, there's no concrete as to what, what exactly Aesop was, just interesting. Any questions? Right. Um, Ishmael did repent, Steve Levy is correct, Ishmael did repent. Um, Looks like the Bahrainians are repenting, and it looks like the uh, Saudi Arabians are repenting also. But um, now we just got to get the Palestinians to repent, and all's hunky dory. The question is, what constituted being a Jew at that time? Yeah, so that's what's debated. What was a Jew at that time? What's right? So what is a Jew at that time? So is it just being a son of Rivka, the, the child of Sarah? It's 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 debated. Oh, the son of Yitzchak, it's debated. It's, it's right, 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 right. It's, it's, so it's debated. So most people say he was the Israel Mumma, he was an apostate. Um, therefore, he was Jewish. He was a, he was a Jewish that a Jew that turned his back on his Jewish brethren, right? Um, any questions before we go? Lenny, tomorrow morning, 7.30, 80 feet away. Everybody has masks. By the way, we, we are struggling with uh, Minion every morning. So I know there's a couple of you guys that, that come sometimes. If you can make a Minion, we, we, we have the whole place open. So if you take a look, it's not just the, the shul. It's the whole place. And uh, Mondays and Thursdays are Torah reading days. So. Come. Isn't it um, isn't it our objective to bring Esau back? So we look back at the mountain of Esau as a redemption. Our whole objective as a people is to bring Esau back and to cure the Romans 
and to let them see that uh, what they what they never took. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that there's a that is a that is a proper thought. Another thought is Loreshes as Haseir to conquer Sayer and get rid of them. So that's according to other opinions. So um, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. It's unclear. I'm unclear anyway. Um, all right. God bless.